never in a million years thought that I would feel this way about ice. This glacier has stood here for thousands of years and I can't help but feel like I'm just watching it at the end of its life. It's a really strange feeling. It's kind of sadness. There's nothing really that puts this more into perspective than this scene behind me. What we're looking at there is kind of mind boggling. That lake didn't even exist a few decades ago. It is the result of human activity and human activity only. 28 countries around the world have already declared a state of climate emergency. One of the most undeniable places to observe these effects is the ice caps. I've come to Iceland to see this for myself and amidst a catastrophe, search for any hope. That's Europe's biggest glacier right there. It's already shrinking at a really, really quick rate. In fact, what we're walking on right now is a glacial lagoon. So this whole area only appeared 10 years ago and this is where the glacier used to be. I can't believe that we're actually walking on something right now that is thousands and thousands of years old. It's been here since the last ice age and it could all be gone within our lifetime. This cave here that we're studying right now is absolutely spectacular, full of ice. It's, uh, it's not gonna be here by summer because the cave systems here change every single year with the season. This was basically created by the melting water of the glacier flowing at speed under the glacier itself and uh, it's already shrinking day by day. But every year, new cave systems are created and the glacier recedes even further. Inside of this glacier, you can see there's bubbles. These bubbles can give scientists an indication of carbon levels from the air that was trapped there at that time. And they also can tell them about temperature. So we are literally looking straight back in history, just looking through that piece of ice. This is as close as we're going to get to the fastest moving part of this glacier. This entire glacier, the largest in Iceland, covers between 8 and 10% of Iceland. So when you think about it, that is a vast amount of water. As this glacier melts and that water is released into the ocean, that is going to have a big effect on the salinity, but also the currents. Over 20 different species of whale, from blue to humpback, visit Iceland's waters each year. I'm joining Eldin Tours to see how this glacier melt could affect Iceland's most sought after wildlife encounters. So this awful circle, this is the planet, okay? We have ice and we have ice. So these two bits, the poles, they're known as the cryosphere. And in the middle, right in the middle here, do, 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 you've got the tropics. The thing that regulates this whole system is called the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. So there's a current that carries the warm water from the tropics that travels up to the poles where it cools down and it sinks. 
and as it sinks it takes nutrients and it takes oxygen to the lower levels of the ocean. That is then carried back to the tropics where it warms up again and then the same thing happens in the south. Now this is what controls our weather, our climate and also the movement of nutrients in the water. If these ice caps melt, we don't actually know at this point what will happen to the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. The really, really interesting thing about Iceland in all of this though, is Iceland actually has its own jet stream that was only discovered recently in the last 10 years or so. And that is possibly the biggest source of cold, cold water feeding into the system. this stretch of water that actually brings the whales here in the first place? Uh, it might sound surprising, but it's, it's the food. It's the fish that it's about. Uh, it's a really important feeding ground. It's just with the slightly rising temperatures, we're having different species, different types of fish coming into the bay, um, and that is causing pr troubles. What would you say your biggest concern is then for the whales in this area and their future? <laughs> Yeah, it's the fact that they're not finding food, so they're not, they're not finding the strength to go back to their migration. Uh, they can't go to their breeding grounds, uh, but they'd rather just stay here for an extra winter to get more food to maybe breed later on. After experiencing some of Iceland's unpredictable weather, I've had a bit of time to reflect upon everything that I've learned so far. And now I want to find out just how quickly this process is happening. So after going up that glacier, we have been lucky enough to get in touch with a glacier expert. The plan after this is we're gonna have to drive southeast. Um, so we've got about 45 minutes of, of driving and then hopefully we're going to be able to catch the guy that has written this paper. Everybody's walking toward the dead road On a place in a foreign world Tad away isn't broken like a starlet I am drunk but I made for her. I was made to fall in love with you. I was made to fall in love with you. Sticking to the roads that we had left here. It's Sarah. I, we're just at the car park now. Whereabouts are you? Sarah, nice Sarah. to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, thanks. This is very good for the, for the whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> just exactly how much ice are we losing here? Well, uh, we did the research on this glacier here. Uh, we modelled it as it was in 1890 when it was at its maximum extent. We then uh, estimate the volume, and to put it into a context, the amount of ice that has been melted here is similar 
of that if you took uh, the ice melted into a 20 foot shipping container and remove one every second or about 2000 every hour and that has been happening for 120 years just the one glacier behind us. yeah so you can double it if you uh, add in uh, more glaciers and we are just talking about uh, from this side of the uh, ice cap this is an iceberg that has broken off the, the glacier and been floating on the lake and then uh, uh, come out with the current uh, with the river and is stranded here at the beach so this was one piece of the of the of the glacier so this was once a snow and uh, it was then metamorphosed into into ice with time and then it's uh, streaming with the with the glacier downward to the to the terminus of the glacier where it breaks off into the lake and floats how, how long would it take to actually uh, make this one bit of ice? Uh, well, the ice from that outlet is about 300 to 900 years old, so... Oh, wow, so it's got a lot of history, yes. this ice right here. Right. Is this going to be here for a long time? No, it, it will be, be very small tomorrow, and the day after it's probably vanished. Really? So just two days, something that's yeah. 800 yeah. to 1,000 years old is kind of... Yes. Gone. Yeah. We are uh, producing so much carbon dioxide that is uh, warming up our, our atmosphere. So, yes. Do we need the glaciers here to continue our way of life? No, not really. We, I think we would survive without them, definitely. But uh, uh, this is uh, also a question of uh, how far do we want to go? Do we want to change the face of Earth only for our habits? Is that what we want? Talking with Snerver is fascinating and it's crazy to hear the rate at which the effects of climate change are happening here in Iceland. If we're going to stand any chance at reducing this, we must first understand exactly how this process works. This is a normal carbon cycle, so person, an animal, they breathe out carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere, then it is taken in by a plant and the plant can then store that in its roots into the soil and when the plant dies as well, that carbon, part of which will then go into the soil. If you think of the soil as a semi-permanent storage, then this movement between the carbon in the atmosphere, in the water, in the ice, in the soil, that's constantly moving in synchronicity. What we have done is we as humans have taken, using a great big metal straw, we've sucked up some of the carbon here and released it out into this system. And you may be thinking, why and how? Well, basically, when we remove fossil fuels from the ground, they are very, very long chains of hydrocarbon and it's energy. We took that energy, we took that carbon and we we pumped it out and we burnt it to use it for our cars, for our engines, and that has now been released into this carbon cycle. The carbon cycle now is a little bit out of sync. It is moving around quicker than ever before. Now, that carbon in the atmosphere is changing our weather systems and our climate, and that is what is melting our glaciers as well. Now, without the ice and the glaciers, we're also getting more carbon into the atmosphere, which is speeding the whole process up even more. What scientists are trying to do is find a way of taking carbon from the atmosphere and placing it back down here into permanent storage systems where it won't be in that carbon cycle. That is basalt rock, and that is what makes Iceland so exciting right now. Iceland's actually home to hundreds um, of volcanoes, in fact. Uh, 30 or 40 of them are still active right now. What you're looking at behind me here, I'm stood in front of an absolutely huge lava flow. So this is lava 
that has cooled when it hit the ocean and um, it's formed these massive pillars. It is, in fact, basalt rock. It is a bit of a contrast thinking about something that came out of the ground absolutely <laughs> incredibly hot and I'm stood in the middle of snow right now trying to climb up and get to it to see it closer. Just can't imagine anything as hot as lava in a place like this. There's scientists that are experimenting to see whether or not this could be one of our solutions for climate change. Icelandic geology is among some of the most interesting on the planet. Its volcanic properties allow it to produce so much of this incredibly useful rock. One of the most well-known attractions in the country is at the epicentre of all of this, and I am about to check it out for myself. On our way to hunt down some scuba diving instructors, that um, this is their home turf, this beautiful winter wonderland. You've got to get a shot of that, Dan. I've never, ever, ever on a dive ever had somebody shovel the snow out of the way like that. It's reassuring. So we've arrived at the Silfra fissure. Now this is basically a gap in the ground which is caused by two tectonic plates, the Eurasian tectonic plate and the North American tectonic plate, pulling apart from each other. And this is one of the fissures or the splits in the ground. This particular one apparently is about 40 metres deep. These movements of the tectonic plates, that pull, that shift though, is why Iceland is so special, why it's got so many volcanic systems, such amazing access to geothermal energy and also so much basalt rock. <laughs> As far as diving in Iceland is concerned, it doesn't get much more famous than this site. Give me your last final thoughts. You guys coming in? No, in for a penny, in for a pound. <laughs> Each year, this two degree stretch of water attracts divers from all around the world. It's absolutely bright turquoise and bright blue in there. It's uh, it's like a, another planet, just like this whole country. of these tectonic plates uh, pulling apart and colliding is this, a great big hole in the ground. This is a geyser. That hole extends right down into the Earth's crust until it hits the magma at the bottom. Now that magma is really, really, really hot and the water in here, it starts to boil at the bottom of there. And when enough energy is produced and enough bubbles from that boiling water needs to be released, it goes whoosh, 
shoots up into the air and there we have a geyser. That exact same principle is being harnessed to create geothermal energy. However, it's not totally clean. There is still a little bit of carbon emissions that come through that and that is what CarbFix are working on. Did it film that? This is the reason that we've come to Iceland. Behind me is Helsheri Geothermal Power Station. And this is the place where they're actually testing the carbon storage technology. My name is Kauri Helgeson. I work for CarbFix, uh, which is a company specializing in carbon capture and storage. And I am a research and innovation project manager. How does it work? We take CO2, we dissolve it into water yeah. and uh, we essentially make sparkling water. So you have carbonated water that we inject deep into the ground mm -hmm. and there, there we have basaltic rocks. So these special kind of rocks are very rich in metals such as calcium, magnesium and the, the dissolved CO2 eats up the rock and it releases the metals you need for it to make stable minerals. So in the end, you've taken gas and you've turned it into rock. This is taken from about 800 meters depth. And um, so uh, what, you, you, what you can see here is that it's very porous. It's got a, you know, all these holes, the empty mm. spaces. And most of these spaces you see are filled up with these white spots. And uh, these white spots are these carbonate minerals that once were CO2 molecules in the atmosphere, and now that they are turned into these crystals. We found that it mineralizes within two years. You essentially need three things. You need favorable rocks, such as the volcanic rocks we have here in Iceland. Um, you need a lot of water. Um, it can be seawater, but we use fresh water. Um, and you need uh, a concentrated source of CO2. We could import the CO2 here. Um, you can ca actually transport CO2 from another country to Iceland? It's, it's on the table. Wow. Uh, we are just um, slowly realizing the potential. Only in Iceland you could store all human fossil fuel emissions for many, many years. We won't meet the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement unless we do carbon capture and storage. Um, and we actually have to just go negative. We need to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere as well. We are working with a Swiss company called Climeworks and they have a technology um, where they basically suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. And uh, we are doing that at our power plant right now on a, you know, a pilot scale. So when we're talking air capture, yeah. it's really suddenly Iceland doesn't have a lack of CO2 anymore we have access to all the CO2 in the atmosphere. This will be a game changer for you know, uh, industries that have no means of reducing their emissions uh, in the near term future. That was one of the most positive conversations I've had in a long time. It's genuinely exciting to know that technology like this already exists. There's so many reasons to feel down about climate change. But here's something we can actually feel optimistic about. Still have to change our mindsets. Yes. Otherwise yes. It's, it's not going to yes. be. Yes, not enough. It's not enough. I mean, if you take any one solution um, and you work out the numbers, it's not enough. We need to do everything in parallel and educate and change our behaviors reduce our emissions, uh, transform our economies, transition to renewable energy, um, do carbon capture and storage, plant trees, take CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, everything must uh, work out and, and we must do this um, uh, at, at a pretty rapid pace. We just need to get on with it. Yeah, we just, we just need to do it. The solutions are there. Um, we just need to accept that this is a big problem and we need to make it our first priority to deal with it. And if we do that, we can solve climate change. 
Would you come and take it all? 